It's now been a little while since the second season of Prehistoric Planet has been released. One of the animals that had the briefest appearance was a dromaeosaur by the name of Karu, which just so happened to be named relatively recently. The real story behind this interesting theropod is much longer than its most recent description, and it shows that the Gobi Desert was crawling with raptors. The dromaeosaurian theropod dinosaurs, what have been affectionately called raptors by paleoenthusiasts thanks most likely to Jurassic Park and in stark opposition to ornithologists and birders everywhere, are generally rare throughout the fossil record. Despite this general rarity, the group itself is still one of the best represented and best studied of the theropod dinosaurs that belong to the group Paraves, which of course also includes everyone's favorites, the birds. But also every Everything else that looks like a dromaeosaur that is technically not one, like the troodontids, unenlagiids, and the like. The dromaeosaur dinosaurs were central to the recognition of living birds as living dinosaurs, thanks to old Deinonychus and John Ostrom. Due to a slew of expeditions to Mongolia by the American Museum of Natural History in conjunction with Mongolian, Russian, or Polish teams, experts, and the like, a whole bunch of dromaeosaur remains and the data they preserved were collected and described throughout the 1980s and 1990s, resulting in a strengthening of the dino-to-bird connection brought by the famous Terrible Claw. Then came the real clinchers. The feather-suited, skeletally complete Chinese raptors, Microraptor, and Sinornithosaurus. Regardless of their importance to the understanding of the dino-to-bird connection, the dromaeosaurids have been found to be an exceptionally diverse group. Each one found tends to be quite distinct to those known. Only in the last three decades has the knowledge and understanding of this group and how it evolved began to increase and increase exponentially. The first dromaeosaurids were most likely small, non-predatory animals living in the undergrowth or high up in the trees to keep away from the much larger dinosaurs of the Jurassic. These little precursors that may have looked quite a lot like birds even this early on would diversify into all manner of ecologies and morphologies. There were the long-snouted fish-eating unenlagids, the small, arboreal, gliding microraptorines, and the ground-dwelling macro-predatory eudromaeosaurs. So far, the eudromaeosaurs make up the bulk of the raptors known and are from Europe to Asia to North America. The best of the remains of these raptors originate from the red or white sandy or limey layers of rocks of the Gobi Desert, the late Cretaceous of Inner Mongolia and Mongolia proper. In fact, Mongolia was a hotbed for dromaeosaurs, Velociraptor, Adasaurus, Achilobator, Sagan, Linoraptor, and Shri. What's even more interesting here is that all known Mongolian raptors have been found to group together as their own group, the Velociraptorines. Meanwhile, Achilobator was a giant outlier more closely related to the giant short-skulled brutes of North America. In 2021, James Napoli, Alexander Rubinstahl, Bjart Anjan Bueller, Alan Turner, and Mark Norell published a study in the journal American Museum Novitatis on the remains of yet another dromaeosaur from Mongolia, this time from the Kulsan locality, which was also the final resting place of the 2021 published Shri Devai. This dromaeosaur specimen was first uncovered in the Gulsan area of the Gobi Desert by a joint American-Mongolian expedition on July 5, 1991, by a team of many paleontologists, including the world-renowned Mark Norell. Norell and colleagues James Clark and Altangerel Perel reported on this specimen as a distinct new dromaeosaur at a Toronto conference of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology a year later. A few years after that, the same team published a paper on another quite distinct dromaeosaur, Achilobator. In this publication, the team provided a bibliographic entry titled Morphology, Dromaeosaurian Dinosaur, Iracoraptor, from the Upper Cretaceous of Mongolia. 
as it would happen, this is almost definitely a direct error, as no such paper existed nor exists to this day, and is definitely a reference to the 1992 abstract that Norell, Pearl, and Clark presented at that Toronto conference. This makes the name Erica Raptor a nomen nudum, a naked name which is something that looks exactly like a scientific name of an organism and may have originally been intended to be one but has not been published with an adequate description. A nomen nudum for the specimen designated IgM-10981, the specimen found at Colsan in 91. The 2021 team presumes that the made-up name Iricaraptor was meant to mean Kumis Thief, with Kumis being a mare or donkey milk product made in Central Asia. It can also go by Arag or Arak. Not relevant, but I think it's funny someone wanted to call a dinosaur milk thief. Oh yeah, Kumis is fermented milk and is alcoholic. Sounds particularly interesting. Imagine a white Russian, but with Kumis. Yeah, well, the dude abides. This specimen has a little more academic history to it before it was given a full proper description and name in 2021. For example, a chunk of bone from the specimen was described back in 2006 along with the very Velociraptor-like Sagan. An incredibly special specimen of Velociraptor grade Dromaeosaurid was uncovered from an area called the Zos Wash which is near the Uka Tulgod area of the Gobi back in 1998. This specimen is special because it's the arm that preserves what is scientifically referred to as ulnar papillae, but what we can call quill knobs. You see, the presence of quill knobs means there were large feathers rooted to them. The lack of these knobs doesn't mean there were no feathers, as plenty of living birds lack knobs but have feathers, but their presence is a guarantee of feathers. This specimen got a description in 2007 but was mentioned in the 2006 Norell paper in which he thought the specimen may belong to Sagan. The 2007 paper mistakenly identified this Zoshwash specimen as specimen IgM10981, which happens to be the one we are talking about, and which was only fully described in 2021. The specimen itself is a fragmentary skeleton made up of bits of the noggin, 14 neck, back, and hip vertebrae, and three tailbones, bits of the right and left upper limbs, bits of the pelvis, bits of the femur, tibia, and bits of the feet. The new team decided to name this little guy Kuru Kula. Kuru Kula is a deity venerated in Tibetan Buddhism. Considered peaceful to semi-wrathful, she is usually depicted with four arms, holding in one pair of hands a bow and arrow, and in the other pair a hook and noose, all of which are made of flowers. Kurukula is particularly associated with major life transitions. The team made sure to emphasize that the name Kuru is not in reference to the cannibalism-born prion disease of the same name, because that would be pretty damn gruesome and perhaps insensitive, but honestly pretty metal. Maybe the metal cannibalism name should be reserved for a dinosaur that preserves cannibalism. Am I being too edgy? The Kuru bones were found coming out of an outcrop of the Barun Guyot formation, which is lithologically similar to the sandstones of the Djokta formation, with lithology being the study of the physical characteristics of rocks. In this context, referring to the sediment size, mineral origin, orientation, colors, and more. That therefore means that the rocks of the Kulsan locality that contained our new little dinosaur friend, and that is a part of the Barun Goyot formation, are also quite similar to the rocks of the Djokta formation. As you can tell just from my explanation, rigorous efforts to get a handle on the times of these rocks has been a pain in the ass. It's been such a pain because there is a lack of precise geochronological data and observable contacts between rocks and rock layers. All that anyone has been able to say with certainty is that the Barun Goyot rock layers at Kosan are between Campanian to Maastrichtian in age. These are the last two chunks of time of the latest Cretaceous, so 83.6 to 66 million years ago. This may not seem like that big of a span of time compared to the whole rock record, but this is still quite a margin and makes placing different dinosaurs and ecological fauna groups in chronological order a pain in the ass.
Once all of the individual bones of Karu were fully described in excruciating and necessary detail, the team tallied up all of their specific traits and ran it through some software that contains a bunch more traits from a bunch more dromaeosaurs to figure out what kind of dromaeosaur it was and what it was most closely related to. They found that Karu placed most closely to the stubby-toed Atosaurus, which is uh, also Mongolian. This means it also belongs to the Velociraptorine subgroup. Karoo is therefore the second Velociraptorine eudromiosaur reported from the Kulsan area. It was serendipitously found only a few hours apart from the first one, Shri Devai. The presence of Karoo in this area and time adds new detail to the understanding of the ecology of the time and place. The area was dominated by the Velociraptorine dromaeosaurs, but also the goose-like Halskoraptorines. The team describing Karu suggests it is plausible to assume that Karu and its relative Shry may have had similar diets due to rather similar skeletal anatomies. But the skull of Shri was never found. I defer to their expertise, but another possibility is that they had similar skeletons but wildly different skulls to avoid competition with one another by going after different prey items. The presence of multiple dromaeosaurs in one area and time, or even multiple velociraptorine dromaeosaurs, is not uncommon as multiple other sites across Mongolia have shown presence of multiple little groundhogs. As fieldwork and study of Gobi fossil material continues, it is possible that other Gobi localities will prove to have hosted multiple coexisting velociraptorines. Whether the dromaeosaurid faunas of each locality remain distinct as more fossils are discovered will be important for assessing the mechanisms that led to the development of each locality's characteristic fauna. So, due to the cluttered and funky rocks of the Gobi, a lot of past workers would lump any dromaeosaur fossils into the Velociraptor genus. This is because there was no definitive way to specify species, and sometimes genera, when there was no distinct separation of rock and therefore time between them. The more specimens that are uncovered and described with enough traits to separate them from known genera, the better, as it builds a more and more robust set of data to compare and contrast with even more fossil material, all of which helps to broaden the ecological and evolutionary understanding of these dinosaurs over time. The recognition of Shry and Karu as distinct critters also helps to prove that multiple different animals that are closely related and that have similar body plans can and did coexist in the past just as they do today. After all, almost all of the really big, big cats of the world are species under the same Panthera genus. You can only tell the difference between them on the outside. With what can be gleaned from the few bones of Shry and Kuru, Kuru was probably quite a bit similar to Velociraptor in overall shape and size. Let's bring in Mr. Man to get a better idea of how big this Kuru creature was compared to a human being. It may have been about six and a half feet, two meters or so in length, with a long narrow snout, a fat recurved toe claw for pinning prey, and moderately long hands and claws for grabbing small items as needed. Thanks, Mr. Man. As a dromaeosaur and a velociraptorine dromaeosaur living in a place that could get cold at night, it was almost definitely covered in feathers. Anything beyond that is pretty much just speculation. I would like to draw your attention to its teeth. The spat of teeth at the very tip of the jaw were quite tall and only bent backwards near the tip while the teeth near the back of the jaw were shorter and wider. What this means for what the thing was eating is unknown. Kuru makes its first appearance in any form of media in 2023's Prehistoric Planet 2. It appears in the Badlands episode in which it steals eggs from distracted Corythoraptors at night once temperatures decrease. As this is a night scene, the Kuru design cannot be fully observed. From what can be seen in the moonlight, the Kuru reuses the model used for the Velociraptors in name only of both seasons, which, as far as the only known specimen can say, is as good as it can get. Colors are entirely speculative, unknown, and not particularly visible, though I think she looks a bit grayer than anything else. She steals some eggs to bring back for her chicks, giving a nice callback to Jurassic Park 3 and White Tip's journey of Dinosaur Planet.
I would very much like to speak to whoever gets to finalize the names for these documentaries because we are in desperate need for something new. They are all starting to sound the same, which is not good for a product. You should want your product's name to stand out among all others, I would think. What do I know? So that's about it. There isn't a ton of information about the actual hands-on biology of the animal known because it is just one broken specimen. That specimen does have a lot of good bones in it and enough to give you a general idea of what it may have looked like, but not much else. I think it's neat, and what it means for Mongolian dinosaur ecology is even more neat. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.